Greetings from Mesa View United Methodist Church of Albuquerque, New Mexico. We hope this message will be meaningful and relevant to your life and your relationship with God. We are located at the corner of Taylor Ranch and Montana Road, and we invite you to join us for worship every Sunday. Our traditional service is at 8.30 a.m., and our contemporary worship is at 11 a.m. More information may be found at our website, mesaviewumc.com. To honor all copyright restrictions, we have removed some audio and video footage from this message. Now may you be blessed through the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Today's Hebrew scripture reading comes from Proverbs, chapter 31, verses 10 through 31. A capable wife who can find, she is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from far away. She rises while it is still night and provides food for her household and tasks for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff, and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor, and she reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid for her household when it snows, for all her household are clothed in crimson. She makes herself coverings. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the city gates, taking his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She supplies the merchants with sashes. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her happy, her husband too, and he praises her. Many women have, many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a share in the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the city gates. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So in your bulletin, you'll find the blue scripture insert. On the back of it is a place to make notes um, from today's message. So I invite you to take that out and make use of it to remind yourself of things to, to take home with you from today's service. And today we conclude our series on the book of Proverbs by looking at what has become known as the Proverbs 31 woman. When I began planning this series, I knew I was going to be talking about this verse. I didn't know anything else that I was going to talk about, about Proverbs, but I felt I needed to address this because it's become one of the most used, and I would argue most abused, scriptural passages, at least for a portion of the church. In her wonderful book, uh, Year of w Biblical Womanhood, Rachel Held Evans says, In the fundamentalist Christian subculture, there are three people a girl's got to know before she hits puberty. Number one, Jesus. Number two, Ronald Reagan. And number three, the Proverbs 31 woman. Wander into any women's Christian conference and you'll hear her name. Visit a Christian bookstore and you'll find entire women's sections devoted to books that extol her. Visit any Christian college and you'll find guys who want to date her and girls trying to be her. Now I do have to admit that I changed that quote a, a little bit because she originally didn't use the, the term fundamentalist and said she used the term evangelical. But I reject this, that the one side of the church has sort of claimed that idea as their own as if the rest of the church can't also be evangelical. I think that we as the mainline churches or progressive churches, however you want to define where we are, need to reclaim that term as our own as, as well. That's personal tangents. <laughs> but the, the woman, the Proverbs 31 woman, is held up within conservative churches as the ideal, the standard against which all women will be judged. Except that the portrayal of the ideal woman they hold up actually doesn't match up against the passage from Proverbs 31, nor does their model of the traditional woman even match up with anything that's traditional within the church or within human culture, and their image and role for women is actually very new within uh, culture and society. 
So today I'm going to propose an entirely different way of seeing and viewing the Proverbs 31 woman than the way most of you have probably heard about her. And I think it's not only more authentic to the text, but also more authentic to, to the tradition of how this passage has been held. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so first things first. Way back in our first message on the book of Proverbs, one of the things I said was that while Proverbs are true, they're not true in all times and all places, right? So Proverbs will apply to a particular situation, but maybe not to another situation. And so you'll have Proverbs that contradict each other. And so, for example, in, in the modern uh, Proverbs, we say that absence makes the heart grow fonder, but out of sight, out of mind. So which of those is true? If your spouse goes away, is it making you long for them, or are you making you forget about them? Both of those things are true, and yet they're true in different circumstances. And so we have to understand when we're talking about the Proverbs, we have to understand the circumstances in which they're being prescribed, understand that, that the opposites can both be true at the same time. Similarly, Proverbs, based on the same thing, can't be taken literally. So, for example, when we think about marriage and raising children, we could have done a, a separate sermon just on the instruction from Proverbs on those things. We hear from Proverbs, those who spare the rod hate their children, but those who love them are diligent to discipline them. This is often now said as spare the rod, spoil the child. That's actually not scriptural. It's sort of a para paraphrasing of that pa pa passage. Now, if we don't actually use a rod on a child, and instead we just spank them with our hands, do we hate our kid? No. If we use praise along with discipline, do we hate our child? If we use a really thick rod and we hit them over the head versus using a really thin rod on the, on the bottom, is one of those more preferable, one show more love than the other? No, I mean, these are sort of rhetorical questions because we can't take the... the, the proverb literally without running into all sorts of problems. And so we have to dig into what's, what's the underlying principle there about setting up structures and rules for children, not only so that they have things to learn from, but they also understand if you run into the street, you can be hit by a car if you don't look, right? And so we, we set up rules and structures to, to teach children discipline, both positively and negatively. And we do the same thing for ourselves and for other adults. And so that Proverbs is really sort of talking about, in order to raise up children, raise ourselves up, structure is an important thing. If we're going to love our children, that's something we need to be doing. So if we take that literally and say, well, no, you have to be hitting them with a rod, it doesn't match the underlying principle that's being talked about. So we have to keep that in mind as we think about the, the woman from Proverbs 31, that this is not a task list, it's not a job description that's being laid out by the writer of Proverbs. We also need to know that this passage, these verses, are a poem. And for lack of a better word, when you write poems, you are being poetic. That is, you're using language to paint a picture. And so you, it's really hard to take a, a poem and read it literally. So we would read uh, the, the book of Psalms very differently than we read Leviticus, right? Because there's a difference between reading rules and reading poetry, reading songs. And so we have to remember that this is a poem, but it's a very specific type of poem. It's what's known as an acrostic poem. An acrostic poem has each line that begins with the consecutive letters of the alphabet. If you'll put up the next slide, Harris. And so in Hebrew, this, these verses consist of a 22-line poem made up of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So that each one goes down, hitting the next letter. And so again, as you're writing this, you have to change your language in order to fit it to the form of this acrostic poem. And so when we ch translate this out of Hebrew into English, we sort of miss the, the beauty and the majesty that goes into creating this passage. But simply understanding that it's a poem should give us a different understanding of how we look at this passage. And the final piece to know 
is that at the beginning of chapter 31, we're told that th this chapter is the words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. Now, we know nothing about King Lemuel. He's only mentioned this one time in Scripture. It's sort of presumed that he's an Israelite king, but we have no record of him. Others speculate that maybe he was an Assyrian king. And there's a Jewish tradition that holds this is just another name for Solomon, and that this is the wisdom of his mother Bathsheba that she has passed on to him. And so the first nine verses of chapter 31 are instructions from the queen to her son becoming king of what kings do, how they live their lives, what they shouldn't be doing. And verse 8 and 9 conclude, Speak out for those who cannot speak for the rights of all the destitute. Speak out, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. So immediately before Proverbs 31, woman passage begins, the king is told, speak out for those who are oppressed in your society. Speak out for those who are being put down or pushed down or held down, for those who don't have a voice of their own. And then we begin hearing this instruction about what this good wife looks like. Now, if you see if you remember, who is the book of Proverbs being written to and for? Young men, and particularly rich young men, those who are going to become the leaders of Israel, either religious leaders, political leaders, military leaders, economic leaders. These are people of substantial wealth who need instruction on how to lead a nation, how to be rulers over people. And so it's written for young men. So the first thing that we have to know about this passage is it's not instruction for women. Right? This is written to young men. Now it could be that therefore this is being set out as a job description. This is the woman to look for to marry. I, I think that's a misreading of the passage. But for the sake of argument, let's say that this actually is instruction of this is what a proper Israelite woman should look like and what she should do. Why is it, though, that we lift up the Proverbs 31 woman and say this is the right thing, but we don't lift up, similarly, the Proverbs 1 through 31 man? Why do we say these 21 verses are what the women are supposed to do and ignore all the rest of the book about what men are supposed to do, about leading lives of righteousness, about speaking out for people who are oppressed, the poor and the needy, about handling your money correctly, about seeking wisdom, all those things we've talked about over the past few weeks. We only lift up one section of being ideal for one gender and sort of ignore the rest. Why is that? Well, I think I have a pretty good idea. There's an African proverb that says, until the lion learns to write, every story will glorify the hunter. <laughs> So who is it that's interpreted scripture, just in a Christian setting, for the last 2,000 years? Amen. Men. It's not that women didn't have their own ideas, their own opinions, their own identity in scriptural stories. It's just that they weren't allowed, with a few notable exceptions that proved the rule, they weren't allowed to write about that or preach about it or teach about it. It was men who were doing the interpretation. And so scripture was used and abused to do a particular view of the world, a particular patriarchal view of men on top and women and everyone else underneath them. And so, of course, Proverbs 31 then was used to say, this is how women are supposed to be. Again, ignoring the first 30 chapters of Proverbs about how men are supposed to be. Except when it wasn't used that way. So last week when we talked about righteousness, I said there's a difference between how Jewish understanding of righteousness and a Christian understanding of righteousness. But to, when we're looking at Proverbs, we have to understand that Jewish piece in order to, to begin to approach what it meant to be righteous in that setting. Well, I think the same might be true for Proverbs 31, that we have to understand this from a Jewish perspective. And who is it that pays attention to Proverbs 31 within Judaism? In Jewish households, do you think it's the husband or the wife who memorizes Proverbs 31? It's the husband. In Christianity, it tends to be focused on women or, or focused on this. In Judaism, 
It's the husband who memorizes Proverbs 31. In Orthodox households, or those who practice Shabbat, which is the meal to begin the Sabbath, the Sabbath uh, day, the husband recites this poem to his wife every single week. He doesn't do it as a checklist and say, this is where you did good this week, and this is where you need improvement. <laughs> he does it in celebration of his wife's presence and the importance she plays in their family and in their society. But it's even bigger than that. If there are no women present at the Shabbat meal, the men sing it in celebration of all Jewish women. And if there are no men present at the Shabbat service, the women sing it in celebration of Jewish womanhood. This is a celebration of the role that women play in society and upholding society and keeping it functional. <coughs> and so I found a, a copy uh, of someone singing. This is just, I have just a brief portion of it, so you don't have to listen to the whole song. And there'll be, the English translation will be up on the screen so you understand as he's singing in Hebrew uh, what the words are. So if you play that video, Paris. Makes you want to start clapping and dancing, doesn't it? <laughs> and so while there are things in Proverbs 31 that clearly elucidate the, the woman's role within the household, such as working diligently, raising children, providing food, making clothing, sort of standard domestic chores, and if that was all the poem were about, then we might say, okay, this is sort of that role being assigned to her. But that's not really what this poem is about, because it's more than just the domestic role that we typically assign to this that's being portrayed. We are told that not only does she do these domestic chores, but she also goes out and buys a field, a role that would normally be done by the husband. And not only does she buy the field, she is the one who tills the land in order to produce the abundant harvest. So think back to the story of Adam and Eve when they're expelled from the garden. Who does God say has to till the soil? Man, Adam. And so here in Proverbs 31, it's the woman who's buying the field and, and tilling the soil. She manufactures clothing, but not only for herself. She sells this clothing to others and to merchants. She's running a, a small business. And we're told that she is helping the poor and the needy. The same thing that the kings are told to do just before this poem begins. Meanwhile, her husband is known at the city gates taking his seat among the elders of the land. Now this was a role that was only available to people who had financial means. If you're just trying to get by economically, you don't have time to engage in theological debates or to talk about the needs of the city and, and run the city at the city gates because you're, you're working all the time. You have to have economic wealth. And so it appears from this passage of, of what this woman is doing that she not only has financial acuity and strength, but she is providing the income for this household. To reverse the old Anjoli commercial from way back in the, in the 70s, not only can she fry up the bacon, she's providing the bacon. And why is she able to do all these things? Because she has fear of the Lord. Right back at the beginning of Proverbs, fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. So therefore, she's a personification of everything that Proverbs has been talking about up to this point of what wisdom looks and acts like. So while some would like to use Proverbs 31 to contain and limit and control women... The reality is this is a testament, a song, to the strength, giftedness, and competency of women. And to make this point even clearer, that women are being, should be being liberated by this passage, something else that's totally missed in the translation into English, is that there's an overly militaristic tone to the words and language that's used. So the gain that she brings to her husband is actually the, the gain normally used referring to uh, plunder from wars, the, the plunder that soldiers bring back. That's what she's giving to her husband. When she acquires the field, the verb used there is usually used in reference to a general who conquers land and subdues it. Only rarely is it ever translated as buying the land. 
when we're told that she girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. This is the language used often when men are preparing for, for war. The literal language is she girds her loins, which is said of soldiers as they're preparing to march off several times in Scripture. When she puts her hands on the distaff, which is a spindle used in spinning wool and, and flax, it's the same phrase used to describe military mastery of a task. And finally, we're told that she clothes herself in strength and dignity. The same thing that, that kings and even Yahweh clothe themselves in, strength and dignity. So rather than constraining the woman to this particular household role and saying this is the only place for women, Proverbs 31 sh shatters those stereotypes. And in the words of one scholar, is designed to alter the, iner the errant male perceptions of women. That it uses these heroic terms, these military terms, and normally reserved specifically for men, so that men will be able to see the splendor and wisdom of women. And rather than being seen as the ideal women, woman that women should compare themselves to, to see as a job description that no one could ever possibly ever fulfill, and thus making women feel less than, not worthy, that God somehow views them as being something less. Instead, we should see this as freeing women. Blessing women for the roles that they play in society, all of the roles that they play, regardless of what that role is. And then we can see this really in the first line of the poem. In the New Revised Standard Version, we heard this morning, it says, A capable wife who confines. The New International Version says, A wife of noble character who confines. Other translations call her a good wife, a virtuous woman, a competent wife. And there's a huge plethora of names for her because no one can say exactly how to translate it. Some of it because they need this, this first line to match the rest of the poem the way it's been translated throughout history. But the Hebrew they're trying to translate is the word ashet hail. And when this phraseology is used in regards to men, which is gibber shail, it's translated as a man of valor. Again, often in reference to a king or a military person who's going off to war. Yeah. So many scholars, in the way that the Jewish Publication Society, which is the, the Jewish uh, English translation of the scriptures, translate this is as a woman of valor. She's a woman of valor, which matches up with that militaristic tone that the rest of the poem sets. This poem of celebration of her accomplishments. Now this phrase, a shet hail, appears only three times in the Bible. Twice in Proverbs, in reference to a, a good wife or a good woman. And the other time it appears is in the book of Ruth. And Ruth tells the story of a, a widow woman who's a Moabite, who rather than going back to her land after her husband dies, she stays with her mother-in-law, Naomi, who is also a widower, now has lost all of her sons. And Ruth stays with her, they go back to Israel, and Ruth does all the work to keep Naomi and herself alive. And eventually then Ruth marries Boaz, a relative of hers. They give birth to a son who then becomes the grandfather of King David, the greatest king in Israelite history. And Ruth is described as a woman of valor. The same phrase is used about her. Boaz calls her that. But he doesn't call her that after she's married, after she's taken on the domestic role, after she's had a child, which is what you would think if the, the normal translation, I mean, interpretation of Proverbs 31 is right, that's when she becomes a woman of valor, as soon as she's fulfilled her womanly duties by marrying and having children. She's called a woman of valor as soon as Boaz meets her. Before she's married, before she has a child, before she takes on the domestic role, because of how she's living her life and standing up and protecting Naomi. She is a woman of valor. It has nothing to do with the traditional roles assigned to women. Instead, it becomes how she lives. Now, in her correspondence with the wife of a rabbi, Rachel Held Evans was told that within 
Judaism, women will use this phrase, a shet hail, as a, a blessing towards others, sort of a you go girl sort of phrase. It has nothing to do, again, with being a wife or a mother, and everything to do with living rightly for God. And even then, it's not something earned, it's just something given in times of celebration, in times of joy, in times of sadness, in times when somebody needs strength. They say, Eshet Heil, you are a woman of valor. Or as Judy Garland said, be a first-rate version of yourself instead of a second-rate version of somebody else. <laughs> so Proverbs is not meant to be a job description to cause you to try to be a second-rate version of somebody else. It's not an assignment. It's an anthem, a celebration of women saying, be who you are, who God has called you to be. Don't buy into the biased and manipulated interpretation of Proverbs 31. Instead, see this woman as an inspiring example of someone who uses her abilities to serve God. So whether you're a mother or not, you are a woman of valor. Whether you're married or single, you are a woman of valor. Whether you work in the home or outside the home, you are a woman of valor. Do that. Live that life with valor and with wisdom. As Evan says, that's what makes the Proverbs 31 woman. Not creating a life worthy of a Pinterest board. So ladies, you are women of valor. To help you remember that, I have a gift for you this morning. I have a card. It's a 5 by 7 so you can frame it and hang it somewhere. In Hebrew, you read the opposite way of rereading in English, and it says, I am a woman of valor. Remember that and live into that. And men, let us remember this is a passage for us. Not for our, the women in our lives. It's a passage for us to learn and to sing about the importance of the women in our lives. I pray that it will be so.